On behalf of the co-organizers of this event, which are UNDP, Eco Agriculture Partners, Conservation International, and the Netherlands Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality, I'd like to welcome all of you to this event. At the Biodiversity COP15 in Montreal in December, uh, the historic post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, or GBF, was agreed by the 196 parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity. With 23 ambitious 2030 targets, the GBF lays out a powerful strategy to conserve biodiversity globally. And it also includes, as you probably know, a very bold call for closing the substantial biodiversity finance gap. What was also unprecedented at the COP was that there were over 1,400 participants from businesses and finance sectors. Uh, this, this had never happened before in the past. And for us at UNDP and managing a portfolio of nature conservation projects in over 140 developing countries, what we have learned is that without redirecting flows of private finance and flows of private and also public finance for conservation and nature positive production, uh, we will not be able to fill the global biodiversity finance gap of at least $700 billion per year. We also know that at least $500 billion per year is invested as nature negative subsidies alone. And if you include the negative flows of private finance, the figure will be really even more immense. UNDP is currently supporting, or soon will be supporting, 130 countries in developing national biodiversity finance plans with prioritized financing solutions. These solutions are tapping both public and private finance and international and domestic finance sources. They include local landscape level financing and more macro financing including a plan to repurpose nature negative subsidies for better environmental and social outcomes. And we are doing this mainly through the Biodiversity Finance Initiative, Biofin work. And in this work, we put a heavy emphasis on making sure the leadership of finance ministries. We are also bringing different government agencies and non-governmental stakeholders including communities, women, and youth to the table to co-develop the finance plan. And through this multi-sectoral biodiversity finance planning process, we are changing stakeholder perceptions and narrative around biodiversity finance. It's not only about you know, financing protected area management expansion, which is very important, but it's not only that. Investing in nature needs to be a core business of any and all economic sectors, agriculture, fisheries, uh, energy, trade, given that half of the global GDP, as you have heard, is dependent on nature. So investing in nature is about ensuring the planetary safety net for humanity. It really has to become everybody's business. And we are also increasingly working with private sector to incentivize nature positive investments through our support, for example, to the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, TNFD, and facilitate a pipeline of investment opportunities through, uh, for example, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs and our Species and Ecosystem Bond related work. And we are also supporting the Biodiversity Credit Alliance to develop a global standard for biodiversity credit to ensure integrity of this rapidly expanding and newly emerged mechanism. 
And back in March this year, I was invited to an international investors conference here in New York as a keynote speaker. So this was also unprecedented for somebody working in the biodiversity field. And in the keynote speech, I emphasized three key factors for successful nature positive investment. One was importance of landscape planning accounting for ecological threshold. Two was respect for resource and land rights holders. And the third point I made was the role of spatial data in facilitating nature governance decision making. I'm sure some of these issues may be discussed, will be discussed in this webinar as well. And I'd like to now end with a quote from European Central Bank Executive Board member, Frank Elderson, who said last month, destroy nature and you destroy the economy. And this is not a tree hugging exercise, but pure economics. There is definitely a significant wind of change, which I'm also feeling in recent years. Financiers are increasingly realizing the fact that nature underpins economy and businesses and the investment in nature is a wise investment. And today's discussion will no doubt contribute to a collective effort to realize nature positive economies, nature positive landscapes and communities. I stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, Midori, for your inspiring remarks and reminding us why the theme of landscape finance is so central to our biodiversity goals and strategies. Um, the interdependence um, between the agendas of biodiversity, climate change, land restoration, food systems, and inclusive development is becoming more and more evident. Even if the planning and funding in these different communities is still often happening in different separate silos. Um, it, it is very encouraging to see new institutional models developing for coordination among these different themes at the landscape scale. In many places, people are responding to their local challenges of sustainable development and ecosystem restoration by forming unconventional multi-stakeholder um, partnerships. They are bringing together farmers, community groups, environmental groups, governments at different levels and businesses to align the management of natural resources that are of shared importance within their landscape. Hundreds of these initiatives are emerging using what we call in short integrated landscape management or ILM under a wide variety of labels um, that are now operating to conserve biodiversity together with other sustainable development goals. Each landscape group approaches these goals in unique ways that reflect their own cultural values, their own contexts, and their own priorities. Our work at Eco Agriculture Partners focuses on understanding and promoting innovations in landscape management and finance. And we also convene an exciting new global initiative called 1000 Landscapes for 1 Million People which is providing tools, resources, and networks for these landscape partnerships. UNDP and Conservation International, our colleagues today here, are stewarding this initiative with Eco Agriculture Partners, along with Rainforest Alliance, Common Land, and Tech Matters, and partnering with dozens of other organizations, uh, we hope with many of you who are on the, the call today. The report we are launching uses the framework of, I'll use the term, integrated landscape finance, which Seth will describe in more detail to draw lessons and recommendations for developing national biodiversity strategies and action plans and national biodiversity finance plans that can scale up and diversify uh, biodiversity finance while also making it more effective. EcoAg produced the report together with Biofin and the Wolf's Company, which is part of Grant Thornton. The report contributes also to a larger body of work on landscape finance within a thousand landscapes and, and you can uh, find more about these from some of the links that my colleague will be putting in the chat. Um, let me now give you an overview of our agenda today, if you put that forward, Shannon. We're thrilled to have a stellar group of speakers who are all doing cutting edge work 
to bring a landscape lens to biodiversity planning and finance. Um, first, my colleague, Seth Seamus, who's the managing director of EcoAg and director of our landscape finance and policy program, will provide an overview of the report and its recommendations. We'll then have reflections on that report from Tracy Cumming of Biofin, uh, the Biodiversity Finance Initiative, Carolyn Van Linders from, uh, the, from the ministry in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, Lena Barrera of Conservation International, and Sunita Subramanian of the Satoyama Initiative of the United Nations University. That will be followed by a panel discussion among them. And uh, please, again, um, for those who weren't here earlier, uh, please put any of your questions into the Q&A um, icon that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and our panelists will try to respond to as many of them as possible uh, in writing. And then a few of them will bring into the, the larger discussion. Um, and then we'll uh, tell you what the next steps are for this. So with that, uh, let's go on to Seth to share the highlights of the report. All right. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Midori. And thank all of you for, for coming today, for your interest in this report and in this webinar. Um, and I'd like to start by thanking the co-authors of this report um, from, from Eco Agriculture Partners, Juan Ramos and Sarah Shear and uh, from the Wolf's company, Esther Wolf, Stein Shep, Chris Duinmayer, and Peter Robinson. And then also, um, like to mention again, the, the, the people the, um, at LNV, and the, the, the Dutch government um, who supported this work financially and in terms of framing Jan Willem Den Besten, Caroline Den Leenders, and Hayo Hanstra, and to Biofin, Anno van den Heuvel, Marco Arloud, and Tracy Cumming for their guidance and feedback throughout this process. So um, if you've clicked on this report, the full version, um, you'll see that it's quite long. It's 117 pages, and I'm sure you're all very interested in all the very rich details. Um, but as Sarah uh, was, was saying, uh, it's true that we have a really fascinating panel here. So uh, we're going to try to give as much time as possible to them. So I'm going to hit the highlights of the report uh, to you know pique your interest, hopefully, to, to dig in a little bit more. So I'm just going to mention the Talk about the goal of the project, what we did to produce it, uh, some of the key challenges for national biodiversity strategies and action plans and national biodiversity finance plans that relate to a landscape lens. And then we'll move right to the recommendations. Um, we do often the eco agriculture partners have a rule about acronyms where we try not to use acronyms. Um, I am not going to be able to keep, keep to that rule uh, talking about this report. Um, but the, the key ones you'll want to know are the NVSAPs I just mentioned. These are the national, uh, the national plans, action plans for biodiversity that, that all countries are supposed to produce. And the NBFPs are the finance plans. So I'm going to use those acronyms liberally. Also, GBF refers to the, the global biodiversity framework that Midori spoke about, which is an agreement at the most, <clears throat> came at the most recent COP to sort of outline the plans for the Convention on Biological Diversity going forward. All right, so the project objective. Um, it was based, so this project was commissioned by the Dutch Ministry of Agriculture, Nature, and Food Quality, which is LNV acronym, um, to, to help parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD, to better understand how the concepts, lessons, and tools of integrated landscape finance can inform the updates to the NVSAPs and the NVFPs, so that they're better aligned with a, a whole of society approach, which is a term that's used in the GBF and better designed to address realities on the ground. All right, next slide, Shan, please. Um, so as far as what we actually did, um, the core of the report came from a, a literature review um, on integrated landscape finance, the NB, NBFPs and NBSAPs um, that was done by Eco Agriculture Partners. So the topics of this review included the principles and examples of integrated landscape finance, the role of a landscape lens historically within the CBD, uh, the process of NBFP and NBSEP development and how these plans could support or inhibit successful landscape scale work. And um, we examined the various roles that governments have played to support uh, landscape scale efforts and landscape finance efforts. And then we also produced a, a case study from Altamayo, Peru that illustrated key elements of integrated landscape finance. Um, and then there were also three deep dive case studies that were done by the Wolf's company. Um, one of them from Murchison, Semliki, 
landscape in Uganda, one from part of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and then one from Cagayan de Oro in the Philippines. And you, could, you can find the summaries for all these case studies in the main body of the paper, and they're also included the full studies that annexes to the paper. So and based on all this work, we developed the report uh, and the recommendations. So let's move on to the content. So next slide. So what is integrated landscape finance? Um, so the lens of this paper. So it's, it's an approach to finance that develops sets of projects across sectors that encourage synergies between investments that move the landscapes towards some kind of transformational vision. So this vision could include objectives on biodiversity or climate or livelihoods or water or other relevant economic sectors or sustainability objectives. So this approach um, doesn't only include bringing in new money, but can include aligning existing flows and mitigating harmful flows. Uh, uh, Midori spoke about the, the importance of that in the context of, bi of biodiversity um, finance more generally. The basic investment thesis, I'll, I'm going to use the acronym ILF from here on for integrated landscape finance to save time, um, is that ecological and economic interactions among different projects and enterprises in a landscape can have powerful negative or positive impacts on profitability, risk, and impacts. And the coordinated management required to implement this can take on can be taken on by an entity um, that can be called a landscape partnership or a landscape initiative. And this is a, a core idea within integrated landscape management more broadly that, that Sarah mentioned. The, the slide you're looking at here is, is just an illustration of what one might call an integrated investment portfolio would, would look like. There's a wide range of, of private and public and philanthropic investment needs and a diverse mix of activities and financial mechanisms and sources of investment across the landscape. So you're, you're looking, you're looking with a, a holistic lens. So if you're interested in, in seeing more of this kind of thing in real examples, actually on the 1000 Landscapes website, we have some slide decks from real places that describe these portfolios uh, a bit more. All right, so the next slide. Um, and so what does it mean to actually do this? Um, you know, briefly, uh, there are dimensions that we've, you know, that we've uh, described uh, in um, of doing integrated landscape finance. So one is a, a, a partnerships craft a landscape transformation strategy, which meets a long term vision of, for the land of the landscape stakeholders. There's defining the keystone investments of an action plan. So this defines prospective projects that will advance the strategy in the near term. Then there's the conversion of these investment ideas to fundable projects, which require designing or incubating projects or expanding them. And this requires clarification of business plans and finance needs. There's the development of suitable finance and risk mitigation mechanisms that are adapted to local need, needs for the specific projects that are set out in this uh, integrated set of investments. And then finally, there's securing the financial resource for these projects. All right, so using this lens, we examined the challenges of developing supportive NBFPs and NBCEPs. Right. So next slide. So NBCEPs, NBFPs, they have different entry points with different processes. And the paper includes detailed analysis of their challenges separately and descriptions of really of what they are and what their processes are. Um, but they have different challenges as they relate to ILF. But uh, for this slide, for the the purpose of time, I've, I've grouped these generally into three main points, bringing them together. So one is the difficulty with using biodiversity as an entry point to facilitate cross-sectoral integration. Even though the importance of working across sectors is widely understood within the biodiversity community. Um, so an implication of this for NBSAPs is it can be it can be challenging to generate this whole of society or whole of government, whole of government's another term that's used within the, uh, the GBF approach that is being called for. For the NBFPs, for the finance plans, this can lead to a lack of diversity in engagement of potential finance sources. So th the result is that there can be a lot of money that's you know, left on the table, so to speak, for biodiversity conservation if there's not a, a expansive view of potential sources of finance. Second one is that there is often a weak relationship between the NBSAP and between NBSAPs and finance mobilization efforts. So this can include a lack of coordination between NBSAP and NBFP processes. 
Many MBS apps have only broad strategies and targets that are expressed as aims or objectives. And this means that the developers of NBF, the finance plans that would you know, theoretically be associated with the NBS apps must often rely on additional official, official documents, such as nat, broad national plans like sustainable development strategies or more specific plans such as protected area expansion strategies in order to obtain costable detail to include in their plans. An action plan and a finance plan can build on each other if they are tightly aligned, which is what happens in an integrated landscape context. Action planning and finance planning can give each other momentum and legitimacy. But at the national level, the NBSF and NBFPs are often led by different actors and involve different institutions. And so this creates a situation where you can get a good paper plan, but there's no clear path to fund its implementation. And right, so the, the final point here on challenges is there's limited direct support for landscape scale action. So understanding that these are national level plans, there's a lot more that they could do to enable planning and funding at a landscape scale where the national biodiversity targets are actually met. Many of these national plans are not spatially explicit at all. So there's no way for them to connect to the local level planning, or it's very difficult to, for them to connect to local level planning. Um, even though there are now a, a small number of subnational biodiversity finance plans that have been developed and the demand for this is increasing. So there does seem to be a movement in this direction, at least for the, the, the biodiversity finance plans. All right, so those are the recommendations. Um, so let, those are the challenges. Let's move on to recommendations. All right, so based on the literature reviewing case studies, we did we generated these six broad recommendations that could help biodiversity leaders, especially in government, to strengthen national level and local level biodiversity planning and finance. So the first one, facilitation of the alignment of financial flows from these sort of different sectors and objectives. Departments and agencies at different government levels could do more to align um, common sustainability vision and planning frameworks. So these frameworks would focus on multiple sustainable development goals, including biodiversity, climate, food, water, et cetera, at national level with clear objectives and targets so that they're synergistic and don't work across purposes. In addition, coordinating implementation of the Rio conventions and, and uh, major initiatives around food, climate, water, and land offer opportunities for biodiversity if they're able to incorporate biodiversity targets into their work. This would improve efficiency and coherence of planning on all these topics. One of the most, one of the most effective ways to better link the NBSAPs and MBFB processes would be for the NBSAPs to create indicative investment budgets that are linked to clear quantifiable targets actions and targets. It could also facilitate dialogue with those involved in the MPFP processes so they could ask detailed questions about the content of the NB NBSAPs. The second one, creating spatially explicit plans um, that link biodiversity conservation to other sustainability goals. Well, biodiversity slide. What's that? Next slide is needed. OK, yeah. Um, Biodiversity conservation requires strongly supportive policies at the national level. It happens in the context of a specific landscape. So national strategies should encourage the development of plans at this scale. In the context of NBSEP development, a variety of tools have recently been developed, such as the UN Biodiversity Lab, or being created that could help governments better align their mapping processes for a wide range of related activities. NBFPs can take advantage of emerging spatial finance and investment analysis tools to do this place-based planning, although these tools are still need significant improvement. All right, so the next one, promoting financial models that support, essentially promoting integrated landscape finance models. So as I described earlier, when I was talking about landscape finance, long-term positive impact on biodiversity requires a coherent set of actions by multiple land users. And this will often require tailor-made investment strategies that target different land users across the landscape and across economic se sectors. And there are a variety of ways governments can encourage shifts to these kinds of finance strategies. So for NBSAPs, they can call for the strengthening of capacities of landscape partnerships and local governments to lead the development of finance strategies that align with local priorities. They can also call for support in structuring inclusive multi-sector, multi-project finance mechanisms, or they could direct invest in them directly. And they could also call for reforms and in incentives, subsidies, and regulations to reduce nature-degrading investments and support nature-positive and land-use investments. So for the NBFPs, 
They can include analyses that build on their reviews of national level biodiversity finance to identify priority landscapes and landscape scale solutions for them. Grant funding to support landscape planning and finance strategies will be critical components of these plans. Okay. Mobilizing private investment. So for private sector actors, both large companies and SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, they're central to the achievement of most biodiversity goals, but they have typically been underrepresented early in, in, in BSEP processes. So in efforts to engage these stakeholders should be priorities, prioritized. For NBFPs, private sector outreach is already an important element, but to the extent that these plans focus increasingly on subnational and landscape level financing plans, the strategies of private sector engagement will need to become more localized with a greater focus on SMEs, cooperatives, and other actors that are critical planning partners at the local level. So in five, strengthening- hey, Just to let you know, we need to wrap up pretty soon. Yeah, Thanks. okay. Strengthening landscape skill institutions. I'll say that um, the report reinforces the, the centrality of landscape skill action and um, a core public sector function to support this could be the strengthening of these efforts by investing in landscape scale coordination institutions such as multi-stakeholder platforms, partnerships, cross-agency government planning mechanisms. Um, and then finally, number six, this is a call for additional technical guidance for the people that develop NBCEPs and NBFPs. Um, and we encourage the CBD and its supporters to build on this work by developing a set of user-friendly technical guidance resources. Um, some of these could be developed as pooled resources across different Rio conventions, one focus would be information on relevant tools currently available that could be for landscape work that could be adapted for various stages of NBSAP and NBFP process. Another could be a set of resources that could focus on implementation of integrated landscape ma management or integrated landscape finance for landscapes that are targeted in national strategies. So with that, uh, thank you all very much again for your interest, and hopefully we can move together uh, on this agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seth, for that quick overview of that very long and rich report. Um, I'd like to now move to the panelists to see what their reflections are on this report. Um, and let me start here with Tracy coming from Biofin. Tracy? So Seth asked me to talk a little bit about what Biofin is doing and then to reflect on, on this report. So I'm going to start with the Biofin side of the story. For the past 10 years, we have been refining a methodology working with countries to develop and then implement biodiversity finance plans, mostly at the national scale. We work around the world. We currently have 40 countries, but as Maduri mentioned earlier, we'll be bringing in another 90 countries, hopefully by the end of this year or early next year. The biodiversity finance plan sets out essentially a pathway for a country to change the policy, economic and finance landscape to support the achievement of a country's biodiversity targets. So typically what would sit in a country's NBSAP. We aim to close the, the funding gap, some of our jargon. Um, we don't only look at ways to bring in more funding. We also seek to reduce harmful actions such as by greening harmful subsidies. We create economic incentives to encourage biodiversity positive behavior and find ways to be more effective with the resources that are already available. We work not only with ministries of environment, but also ministries of finance and others to develop these plans, building a shared vision. Our methodology for developing a BFP is a stepwise approach made up of four components. We first conduct a policy and institutional review, which is essentially looking at the lay of the land, so to speak. Who is doing what? What are the laws and policies affecting biodiversity and biodiversity finance? And what are the root causes of biodiversity change? Sorry about that. Then we look at current expenditure on biodiversity and we cost the actions in the NBSAP. We draw on these three studies to develop a, a finance plan, narrowing down from some 150 kind of good ideas to around 15 that we think are the most impactful and sustainable things that can be taken in the country over the next, say, 10 years. These could be anything from creating investment platforms to developing institutional legal frameworks for things like offsets, um, developing results-based budgeting, revising protected area fees, developing carbon markets. It's, it's, it's always very different. Every BFP looks very different, as it should be. 
While a few of our countries have opted to start with subnational BFPs, for the most part, these are national processes um, which result in national plans, just like NBSAPs. In the beginning, we were pretty separate, but obviously taking cognizance of and complementary to the CBD process. And country financial reporting to the CBD could draw on the results that Biofin produced. Now, with the new Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, not only are um, well, all countries are encouraged to develop national biodiversity finance plans under the new GBF, which is very exciting. Um, and not only are BFPs more explicit in this new agreement, but also goal D under the GBF includes an incredibly powerful call to align all financial flows. And five of the 23 targets of the GB GBF entail the work that biodiversity finance plans focus on. So target 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19, I don't wanna to waste too much time going over them. Five of these targets um, all speak to basically ways to close the funding gap, which, which is very exciting. What the landscape approach brings is a deep focus on the interconnectivity of different sectors and actors in the region. It is fundamentally about integration. When we work with multiple sectors, we are dealing not only with different visions and targets, but also different languages and perspectives and knowledge. This is not just about bringing all the actors into the room, which can be hard enough, but it also entails finding interpreters, so to speak, who can stand at that intersection of different understandings and help to shape a shared vision. At a local scale and at a national scale, this will be crucial if we are to achieve the goals and targets of the GBF. Now more than ever, our pathway needs to be one of integration and system change. And we can look to the landscape programs as leaders in this space. I see the work of regional and subnational landscape initiatives and national BFPs complementing each other. Certain challenges at the local level can only be addressed at the national level, such as national policy alignment or legislative change. If the biodiversity finance plan process is equipped with the right information about opportunities and challenges happening in key regions, finance solutions can be designed to create better enabling environments at the landscape level. This will require national processes to be open to and include in the conversation local and subnational processes in order to learn and respond accordingly. In closing, we have an incredibly large task ahead of us, but I have never been more optimistic. The commitments in the GBF of a whole of government and a whole of society approach, the engagement of the private sector and the finance sector, not, not limited to, but including the work of the TNFD that we see emerging. This is groundbreaking. We've never seen this level of engagement before. If we continue to learn, and to seek collaboration, I think we can do anything. Thank you. And I'll hand back over to Sarah. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy. The work of Biofin is, is very central to all of our steps forward. And we really look forward to seeing the work that will start begin in 2024 um, with working with the countries. Uh, let me move now to Carolyn Van Linders. Uh, Carolyn, give us your perspectives. Hello, Sarah. Hello, all. Good day. Oh, it just, just, yeah. My camera is my camera. Okay, hope so. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much also for the for the other speakers for the importance, the urgency. Um, I do want to thank the 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 uh, researchers, agriculture, walls, and biofin, and um, I wanted to. to say yeah it's just, of course it is important also in the ministry's policy to take a landscape approach and it's getting more and more attention from as well the financial sector policymakers and academics and i just want to share three things with you in this short presentation a little bit on the MBSAP process in the netherlands uh, next steps we are taking or at least we are uh, looking into are uh, the idea of ecosystem services as lens and the need for blended finance and then i will go back to uh, the ambicept process at the end next slide please 
Yeah, well, the MBSEP process, it's, it's being developed. It will be sent to the council uh, in, uh, at the end of this year. And uh, later, uh, we will take it further in uh, the, the, the House of Chambers, House of Representatives, uh, on our way to COP16. Um, we think that Target 19 on resource mobilization offers great entry points for integrating the landscape approach, and that's why I want to take that a little bit further in this presentation. Target 19, it was said by Tracy already, uh, is, uh, for example, about stimulating innovative uh, schemes for the payment of ecosystem services and also levering more private finance. Um, and I want to go a little bit deeper in these two um, topics. So next slide, please. Maybe a lot of you know if you want to, in the next slide, if you want to know nature, one of the ways of, to think about nature's contribution to people is to think about ecosystem services. And here there are the 21 that are listed internationally. And you see two kinds of services, provisioning services, provisioning to us people and regulating ecosystem services that underlie a lot of the provisioning services. In the Netherlands, we have a database, the ecosystem uh, services valuation database. And in its there, it's one of the largest database with 9,500 value points on the monetary value of ecosystem services all over the world. Next slide, please. Um, and you can use this ecosystem thinking as a way to think about finance. And so there are three ecosystem services next to the provisioning that you saw in the slide and the regulating that are beneath in the, in the, in the picture. There's also the cultural ecosystem services. And the interesting thing is that they are financed by different actors. So provisioning services, cultural services, they do have a lot of private finance in them or investing. But the regulating service, there's a lot of public budget involved to keep them um, resilient. Um, there's also another difference between these uh, services. Uh, the regulating services are on a different scale, spatial scale. So they are more on a landscape scale or a, a regu uh, regional scale. Think of a watershed and a river. Um, and the other ones, the provisioning and the cultural services are more uh, on, on a smaller scale, uh, a plot of land or a rec recreational zone. And if you then start to think about how these different ecosystem services depend on one another, that they are on a different scale and that they are financed uh, by different actors, um, um, we are writing a paper about it now. And you see that it's, um, if you want to implement this way of thinking, it coincides with two of the three, two and uh, recommendation two and three of the integrated uh, report on them. Um, uh, landscape finance, to create spatially explicit place-based plans, to promote finance mo uh, models that support multiple projects and synergies from biodiversity. So with this lens of ecosystem thinking, we get to the same recommendations. Next slide, please. And the same happens when you start to think about blended finance for nature. We developed a paper for COP15, developing blended finance capacity for nature on a national level. Uh, it was done uh, by interviewing all kinds of experts, and it turns out that if you want to have a truly good branded finance project for nature, as, uh, it, 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 it has to be based uh, national or it has to take the scale of the biome. For example, global reefs or coral uh, or, or mangroves. So you need to take a place-based um, uh, a way of thinking if you want to do blended finance for nature. And it's also important to bring in all kinds of different, uh, the whole society approach with all kinds of different stakeholders if you think about making decisions on blended finance for nature. The paper contains 23 examples that are already out there, like the Shell Blue Bond, the Moringa Agroforestry Fund, etc. many more. And if you go through them, you see that a lot of these 23 examples do take a landscape approach. And so thinking about blended finance for nature in target 19, you get to the same recommendations as, as are in this report that you need to facilitate the alignment, alignment of financial flows with all the other um, um, targets and, and challenges that are in the landscape and that you can mobilize private finance with this kind of multi-sector blended finance thinking. So it aligns with 
that, that those recommendations. And then for the last slide, almost last slide, last slide, please. So if you take a landscape approach and you connect it to the process of the NBSEPs, we think that there are great opportunities to link it to target 19, especially if you start thinking about um, blended finance, if you start thinking about how to introduce ecosystem services as a way to, um, um, to, to think about investments and what are the best investments. And we therefore also underwrite the recommendations that it's very important that you, that there's landscape level institutions um, and especially that we need a lot of capacity building to, and learning from each other if we want to take this further uh, also in the national biodiversity finance plans. So the last slide is uh, if you want to know more about these next steps we are taking um, then please send us an email for the paper we are writing on ecosystem uh, services. Uh, as a way to think to, to, to look about uh, to look at finance uh, you can also find there's also a website on the blended finance paper with, which will be put in the chat and maybe last but not least there is this report of the asn bank did with the ecosystem valuation database a report to use this monetary value of ecosystem services for new financial models please reach out if uh, we can be uh, of help to send it to you or maybe i can put it in the chat Thank you. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Carolyn. I've known you for a long time, and I always learn more exciting things about finance whenever I hear you speak. Um, thanks a lot. Um, let's turn now to Lena Barrera of Conservation International. Lena, what are your thoughts about this? Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here today. So. Why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll jump right in. You know, at COP15, uh, the agreement there really affirmed what all of us are talking about here, right? That there is no economy and really no humanity without nature. Um, so it was really, you know, exciting to see the level of ambition there and that recognition that we really do need to integrate how we think about financing and broader drivers with our direct biodiversity targets. But we know that uh, you know setting the targets isn't enough. Um, we really we, we're still facing a lot of the same challenges, and what we need to do is really change the game. And that's where a lot of this approach to landscapes and integrated landscape financing comes from. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I want to start with an example of the type of landscape scale work that CI has been involved in. Um, these are places where you can really get multiple outcomes, right? It's about the biodiversity, it's also about climate, it's about restoration, it's about water, education, jobs. Um, so this is a picture of the Chulu Hills in southern Kenya. This region is home to a huge amount of wildlife, right? Very important bird species, some of Kenya's largest populations of elephants, also rhinos and many others. Um, aside from that, it's a cloud forest that provides fresh water for the entire region, including, including the million people who call Mombasa home. So this area is, has, you know, has a lot of challenges facing it, right? It's been deteriorating for decades. Um, there are huge you know, chronic droughts, um, you know, sometimes killing as many as 90% of the local livestock. Um, so lots of lots of challenges. Um, and so for the last nine years, we've actually been working with the local Maasai people to restore and conserve the landscape uh, in a way that provides income for local community and provides a safety net. And so a major source of income in the region is ecotourism. Um, there's, of course, you know, some public funding, philanthropic funding coming in. Um, but an added element has been climate finance uh, through the certification and sale of carbon credits from the landscape, which started in 2017. And that has brought, you know, a, from a $600,000 investment has yielded $12 million in revenue um, and brought income from new sources, mostly the private sector. So some companies like Apple, Gucci, uh, Tiffany, and Netflix. We're expecting that that's going to uh, you know, continue at that scale, bringing as many as 30 million tons of avoided carbon emissions um, over the next, um, or reduced carbon emissions over the life of the project. And what this has done is by bringing these different sources of financing together, it's really created a, um, a steady source of financing that held up even during the pandemic, which is a big deal as ecotourism crashed out, right? So, you know, we've got 
the results here are employment for 100 rangers who are you know, working on elephant poaching and, and other wildlife issues. We've got scholarships for students, new teachers, new classrooms, new latrines, water tanks, um, you know, as really protecting the source of water for a large population and bringing in new industries like a small in, uh, cottage industry on bee, uh, beekeeping and um, really, you know, bringing in new sources of income. So if we go to the next slide, um, right, this kind of multi-dimensional, multi-actor landscape scale effort really benefits greatly from having the right policy framework in place, right? As I think uh, Tracy just mentioned, some local problems require a national solution. Um, and so really by having, um, right now, you know, with countries moving through the NBSAPs and the National Biodiversity Finance Plans, um, this is a great opportunity to integrate these kinds of landscape scale initiatives and all of the different elements that they bring into these um, you know, big national processes so that you, you know, we're really creating an enabling environment for the long-term success of this kind of initiative so that we, you know, we've got policies that are not just focused on the conservation or restoration, which is very important, but also the policies that deal with agriculture and water and the economic policies that create different levels of incentives. Um, and that we're, you know, we've got programs that create new financial flows and they're all working together you know, instead of what you often have in sort of a matrix of, of incoherent policies that can undermine one another, um, right? And so the reason this is so important from our perspective is that we, we're often setting these really uh, ambitious goals, but then we don't set ourselves up to really move the needle on the basic economic problem of short-term economic gains versus long-term sustainable outcomes, right? So it's the threats to biodiversity keep growing and the uh, you know carbon emissions keep growing. And so our efforts to change that can barely keep up if we don't change that underlying system, right? It's a little bit like if you were a runner and you have a knee injury and you're trying to fix that with rehabilitation and surgery, but then you're going running every day to stay fit, right? So instead, you know, we, we need to change something so that you maybe you do the surgery in the rehab, but you're going swimming to stay fit instead, um, and that doesn't hurt your knee. And so the, the NBSAPs and the National Biodiversity Finance Plans are an opportunity for us to, to rectify some of those problems. Um, so going to, you know, what is CI doing? We can go to the next slide. Um, since, you know, since COP15 finished, we've been working to support our government partners to carry out some really robust NBSAP update processes, right? So uh, these are sort of our main focus areas, right? We're providing scientific data to help countries identify places that deliver multiple benefits to people and to nature. So places like the Chulu Hills. Uh, we're also focused on really the, making sure that there's full and effective participation from indigenous peoples and local communities. We've been, a, uh, you know, leading the Jeff Sevens Inclusive Conservation Initiative. So there are a lot of benefits, uh, a lot of lessons from there. And we're focused on how the NBSAPs and the finance plans can help get the economic incentives right. So really changing that you know, set up where we've got this dominant flow of funding to destructive activities and changing that to more nature positive activities. So, you know, our aim here is really to align with um, some of the recommendations in the report around providing governments with user friendly technical guidance and capacity development and providing um, data for spatial planning and, and things like that. So let's go to the next slide. To make this just a little bit more tangible, uh, we can go back to Kenya. So we just supported the Ministry of Environment there to convene a three-day workshop um, to really to socialize the process for updating the NBSAP in their country and, um, and to invite civil society into that process. And uh, Kenya, the government's actually asked us to lead the work on the, the group of targets that addresses nature's contributions to people. So targets nine through 13. Um, and so that's a really important opportunity to bring a lot of these recommendations into, into that process. Um, and, you know, we'll be holding a similar workshop with the government of Guyana just two weeks from now. Um, let's go to the next slide. So to add to that example, um, this is the kind of data we're providing to countries to help inform their prioritization, right? This map is a, shows an overlap of areas with high levels of carbon, 
um, and also high levels of biodiversity. And you can see the darker areas are where you get those overlaps of both. Um, you can actually explore these on that website that's listed there if you're interested. Um, but in addition to this, we're providing similar data on areas that provide high levels of benefits for water and food security and for disaster resilience. Um, and the intention here is to help governments identify the top priority places that they want to either conserve or restore or manage sustainably, um, right? So this could help a country, for example, identify areas uh, like such as mangrove forests that are important for disaster resilience, also for fisheries production and also for climate mitigation. Um, okay, next slide. So, you know, I wanna wrap up by talking about the importance of new financial models, which is a lot of what we're discussing here, right? Um, in addition to you know, providing data on where countries can focus, we're also working with countries to design programs and policies that can help address these systemic challenges that I was referring to earlier. Um, and a big part of that is about bringing changes in the private sector, um, which can, you know, they can bring new funds or simply reduce the damage from production efforts so that we don't have to spend as much in trying to sort of fight against that, right? So there are a lot of different types of approaches here. You know, some are more well established, like payment for ecosystem services. Uh, some are newer approaches, right, like providing low interest loans to help transition uh, to sustainable production practices, you know, creating blended finance approaches, new debt instruments, obviously carbon markets, nature certificates are all important tools. Um, and, you know, this is something we've been working on for, for quite a long time and with a number of different approaches here. This is just one example um, for in the last few years, we've really moved some of our corporate collaborations from focusing on their specific supply chains um, and the sort of specific small parts of the landscape to really saying to companies, okay, we really need to move to look at the, the landscape as a whole, not just the specific small places where you are sourcing, and also to look at the entire sector, right? It's not just about your one company, but we need whole sectors to shift. So this example, the Regenerative Fund for Nature, is one where we're actually working with the caring group to help transform agricultural practice beyond their supply chain to reach across the entire sector, um, and really does get at that third recommendation in the report, which calls for, you know, different kinds of financing models. Um, so next slide, I'll just to wrap up. Um, I think this report's a really important addition to the complex set of efforts that are going to be required to achieve the ambitious goals of the new framework. Um, and, you know, as well as all the climate and development goals that we've set, um, I really, you know, I hope what I should have stimulated some thinking. I also feel quite, um, um, optimistic about our approaches. You know, I think um, there's a there are definitely changes that we haven't seen in the past and new opportunities to create, um, you know, new approaches. And I think the both the NBSAPs and the National Biodiversity Finance Funds are a big opportunity to do that. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lena. Uh, CI is doing so much groundbreaking work in biodiversity, but also integrating the the, the climate piece and the community well-being. Um, so we're really looking forward to continuing to collaborate with you all to move those things forward. Um, let, let me uh, move now to our last panelist, um, Sunitha Subramanian. Sunita, will you go ahead and tell us what your perspectives are from the work you've been doing with the Satoyama Initiative? Yeah, sure. Thank you, um, Sarah, and good day to everyone. Um, so my name is Sunita Subramanian, and I work with the United Nations University, the Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability. We host um, this partnership called the International Partnership for the Satoyama Initiative, which promotes landscape approaches uh, broadly. And I see that we this is really uh, a set of like-minded uh, people out here. So I guess I don't have to get too much into it. We have we have a, a, a term uh, for uh, within our own context, we call them socio-ecological production landscapes and seascapes because that's where our main focus is on. on and so it's conservation that relates um, to uh, sustainable use, you could say, and, and of course, equity aspects. Um, so within, and I could, we could go to the next slide. 
Um, so within this context, so so the way we work with this uh, with the partnership is we we are now about three hundred and odd members um, around the world, including different type a diverse set of members who could range from indigenous peoples to local community organizations, NGOs, um, international organizations, governments, etc. Um, and and uh, what we've been doing uh, for the last uh, 12 years, 12 and a half years now, is to actually promote um, activities on the ground, um, abstract the, in, the evidence that we have on how production is not necessarily leading to uh, loss of biodiversity, but on the, on the converse can actually be um, enhancing, um, and how local priorities um, uh, and their alignment with policy goals need to be more carefully nuanced when policy goals are being set. So we've basically been doing this um, two-way uh, conduit, you could say, um, uh, and also encouraging, uh, I mean, through through funds or um, uh, through networking and 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 such, um, uh, fostering um, more um, uh, learnings between different communities within the partnership. So more recently, um, with the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Institute for Global Environment Strategies in Japan, we've been working on developing a guide um, that, that seeks to integrate landscape approaches into NBSAP development and implementation. Now, this is a good opportunity because with the GBF, uh, countries are in the process of looking at how they're going to be uh, revising the NBSAPs. And this is a good opportunity for us to be pushing for, for this approach uh, also to be integrated. Um, and and just, to, just so that we're all on the same page of what we mean by landscape approaches, really in a nutshell, we are basically speaking about um, uh, acknowledging that there are multiple functions that we derive from a land or seascape and that it provides multiple uh, uses to multiple users. So all of this uh, stake different stakeholders who are out there. But when we get into this- uh, Susan, do you need a more, another slide? Uh, Sunina, I don't know if we're up to date with your slides. Sorry? Are we up to date with your slide? Yes, it's, uh, it, the format has changed. So I had to look a bit to see like, um, okay, what I have with me, because you put it into your design, that's all right, I could just go. This. I'm not getting into the details of the guide that we've developed, but I'll get in a bit to how what you are doing is relevant to what we've been doing. This is fine. I just go ahead. So within the NB SATs, um, uh, I mean, so so one of the points, and I think it was uh, Tracy who raised the point that um, that it's important that the at the national level policy needs to recognize if we have to advocate and if we have to ensure adoption of landscape approaches, it needs the blessings at the top level of planning, and that's why it, this has become more crucial. And there's a lot of um, um, uh, careful thought that even the secretariat is putting on how this guide is shaping up. Next slide, please. Um, so, so what we've done is, um, is to, so what I have here are a set of key uh, messages that we've got that, that come through the whole guide. So we've got more or less a step-by-step -step, um, uh, way to operationalize how landscape approaches can be integrated into NVSAPs. Um, and again, landscape, so we use landscape approaches as a shorthand for both landscape and seascape approaches, although more of the more of the cases that we have are landscapes. We also um, uh, are making this point that there could be a lot of the work will happen at the subnational level, but there could be instances where there would be the country itself would want at the national level itself they may want to take up than um, some instances of landscape. Um, of, of going in for a landscape approach when they're doing certain activities, um, say, for instance, establishing a park and et cetera. Uh, that said, some of the key messages that we have, uh, the first relates to the to the point that that we have we are looking at connectivity between different ecosystems. So basically, there are various governance um, uh, regimes and various management activities 
that could be in place from protected areas to OACNs to manage landscapes and seascapes, but they all form part of a continuum. And that needs to be recognized um, um, and, 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 um, and while planning exercises are put in place, who, get, who gets, whose jurisdictions do these fall? And if there are overlap of jurisdictions, how can co-management strategies be? Um, put in place. Um, so it speaks to um, those first three targets of the GBF. The second main highlight is that it speaks to interrelatedness between different sectoral priorities. So of course, landscape approaches, and when we're speaking about sustainable use and equity and all of that, we are not just speaking about environment related activities or even just um, uh, or, or, or agriculture and, and the more uh, prominent related sectors, but there are several other sectors um, whose uh, activities have an impact um, on the landscape. And, and it could be on either way, the, 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 there are impacts on, on each other to the various activities that are ongoing. Um, so, so really um, what we will we are called what will be called for is a whole of government approach and speaks to um, the various targets of the GBF. Um, and also looking at therefore which which sectors or which ministries would need to be engaged or various other um, stakeholders, uh, relevant stakeholders who would need to be engaged. This next set of here messages speaks to solutions, which require expertise from different streams of knowledge. And that's coming from the more mainstream conventional, sci um, conventional science-based uh, inputs, uh, but also from in, uh, traditional and indigenous uh, knowledge and expertise. And that, any, um, that the solutions would work and would be, um, and, and that, the, that they work would be hinged on respectful interactions between the values of various actors at play. And finally, uh, a final set of uh, messages that, that it is possible that def despite the complexity of all the players, in, um, of all the players out there and all of the decisions that have to be made, um, the that it is possible to have deliberation, to have participatory and inclusive planning across various stakeholders. It's possible, and we all know it's necessary, but it also would require different types of capacity development for different actors. So we are talking of whole of society here, and I and I know that if people, have, I mean, it's it's basically an echo of what's happened earlier. But this is what we've also restated, I guess. Um, and we also sign off by identifying certain requirements that would have to be there, including looking at what indicators and tools that are there, but also identifying that there would be certain there would be financial needs and and um, and we left it at that. We did not get into more nuance about how to access various kinds of finance. And before we get to the next slide, uh, so we could go to the next slide, but I'd just like to reflect a bit on the work that you've done um, with the guide uh, that you produced, um, Sarah, is that I think it, it fits very nicely as a complement to the work that we've been doing because one of the things we, we recently came out of um, a global assembly that we um, that we organized for the partnership and people have been speaking about more about convergence um, across climate biodiversity food security health, all of these various agendas at the local level of implementation but one big one big issue that was raised was well we need to find ways of accessible financing. So it's there's I mean there's a lot of talk about the big finance and, and so it's really heartening to see the kinds of work that's out there and that is something that we should look at to see how we can include that into as as at least a set of resources into um, the guide that we, we are producing. So the the guide itself is, is is in its final stages of finalization. It went into peer review with parties and other uh, organizations and we got the responses. So within a month or so it should be finalized, but we, we hope to include the work that I've been checking the chat, people have put in other um, uh, pieces of work too. So, so we hope we can include those resources too, so that uh, people who will take up countries and other decision makers who will take up landscape approaches would have, would also know where they could look for 
and what they would like to look for in terms of this kind of, uh, you know, more accessible financing, more flexible and inclusive financing. Yeah, and, and some of the stuff in, as next steps, we are working very closely with, um, with, with uh, agencies that are helping assisting parties um, to revise their NDSAPs. Um, and there are various such initiatives out there. I just leave it at that, Sarah, for now. Thank you. That's really terrific. And I and I think, uh, Sunita, you also raised a couple of really critical issues. Um, all of the landscape partnerships all over the world, the thousands and thousands of them, they, they, they can't really wait for necessarily flows of very large money coming down. They need to also be looking at these lo other, more local uh, sources of funding that are that are going on. And, and this is where I think the, the national biodiversity action plans and finance plans can make that a lot easier for the local landscape partnerships. They can really facilitate that, that movement, the knowledge, the information, the technical expertise. So we really look forward to um, looking at your guidance materials and, uh, and collaborating with you moving forward. Well, thanks so much to all of the um, panelists for your, your comments. And uh, what we'd like to do now is, is ask each of the panelists a couple of very sort of specific questions. I, I'd like to start with, with, with one of, 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 of our own uh, and then move to a couple of the questions that showed up in the, um, in the Q&A. Um, and the first one, just very briefly, I'd like to ask each one of you to say, what's, what's the one change you really like to see in the world by whom that you think would really push this agenda forward? And and maybe I'll I'll start with um, with asking Caroline what what would be your 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 priority? Maybe you could put all the videos on for all of the panelists. Thanks. Let's see. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, I did hear your question, and I I think I I did. Uh, I am, you can hear me, but I'm not sure about the video. Um, well, it's of course always so difficult to have the silver bullet question and the yeah. silver bullet answer. Um, um, I, what I think is that the, the most important thing is we all need to be better connected. And as you said, these silos, they are, you know, and that's the great thing what nature does. It brings everything, it relates everything to everything. So. If we are just able to speak with one voice and to, to keep on the, with the same message that nature and biodiversity and it's it is its diversity and its relation to people that makes that it's so connected, which is great and brings you all these holistic insights. And but you have to reduce complexity uh, to make it work in real life. And so taking a landscape approach is a great way to reduce complexity, which makes it possible to work with all these different challenges with people, with the different biomes at the different places. So if that is something that, that will enter minds of people working in business, working in finance, working in governments, I think that and that's the, 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 the force, the great force of nature that you can use, um, and but you have to bring it back to a scale that is workable. And that's where it lands. I, th I think if we, we have that same, uh, understanding and wisdom, uh, then it then it will infiltrate everywhere. I hope. Thank you very much. And Tracy, how about you? Uh, so first, I, I want to second what Caroline just said. It's it's. I I will pull out one group which I'm very excited about, but it is really about integration and have like we can't do this if if it's only led by one group we will fail. So that like it's so important that we're all integrating um but i would say the finance sector the, the central banks and regulators um development banks the private finance institutions um with with that the, the momentum that we're just starting to see if that keeps going and we get it right in that space i think it's going to change change things that we've never seen before so that would be my fantastic my and sunita all right, so so this is a tough one, no? It's because we keep talking about so many stakeholders who and 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 we okay. So so I'd say if I could put influential groups, 
as one set of stakeholders, because we realize that that there are some who can influence more, including governments, and you know, it's it's, it's uh, and 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 the private sector and all of them, but it's not a single influencer. So there are several influencer groups, and that's something that we should target and find out who they are. We do know who they are, but I think that's that's a target yes. group definitely. Um, but uh, in terms of what can, we can do, uh, one of the things again we was we came up with people who are actually making these decisions on the ground is that is about effective communication in innovative ways and education and awareness raising. Because they're like, okay, look, we know this, but it's like if if we want to get the message across and it's to youth, it's intergenerational, all of this has, has to be there because, um, but that means uh, designing messages in a way that, that resonates with these various different stakeholders. So that's definitely important because that's the only way we can motivate people to take action unless they see there's something in it for, for them too, know that it's not something that's just conceptual and something someone will do somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how about you, Lena? Thanks, Sarah. So I'm sort of on the lines with Tracy, right? I think it's the ministries of economy and finance, right? They, they are the ones who, they have a, a really big potential to change the rules and incentives that are driving behaviors at an institutional level all the way down to individual choices, right? And so if they can take in, you know, the understanding of the value of nature and integrate that into the broader framework, then I think that can make a significant change, right? I think for the most part, you know, ministries of finance and the and economy, they're not thinking about this, right? They think about nature and it's 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 an expenditure, right? They're not seeing it as an underlying um, asset, basically, to the economy. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I'm an economist myself, and the reality is that most of those economic ministries don't think about place-based economic development, uh, but some of them do, and they're pretty could be really great, uh, very allies in this. Seth, how about you? When well, I guess the the big picture thing that that I would say is that um, as much as we're talking about the needs for finance for for nature and finance at the local level, when you speak to many participants in the financial world, their response is that there's nothing to invest in. So um, I think there's there's, there's a real challenge of creating um, investment opportunities, financial products that incorporate all the things that we're talking about that are informed by locally led uh, visions and strategies and values, um, and that those can be transformed into a uh, an opportunity that these investors can recognize. I think that's um, the big picture vision of what I would like to see change. And of course, that's much, much easier said than done. Yeah. But I think that's kind of a North Star, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Let me move to one of the questions that came from the, um, from the Q&A, um, which is very practical one. Um, for how do you create these spatially explicit place-based plans, if you're a national biodiversity planner, what, what do they need? What tools, um, what improvements are needed to make that connection between what's what's needed at the landscape level to really cat and how the national plans can catalyze uh, that that and support that action at the landscape scale? Can I ask a couple of you all to, uh, to make a response to that? Um, I think CI mentioned a few of the of the tools that you all are working on. Do you have uh, some sort of concrete suggestions about making that connection? Can you hear me? Uh, now I do. Yes. Go ahead, okay. Alina. Everything froze for a moment. Um, you know, I, I think maybe we're all a little bit. Uh, you know, in silence because it's a very big question, right? Um, so many <laughs> things are needed to make that happen. And, and maybe that's why, you know, it's not happening as much as, as it could be. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, the biggest thing we find is that you need good data and that's not always easy to come by. And it's, um, it's often held in different parts of the government or sometimes not even in the government, but in, you know, an academic setting or, 
otherwise, and sometimes the data is not compatible. And um, sometimes you've got global scale data that you can look at from a national lens, but you don't have the national data, um, which, you know, you can make do with global data, but sometimes countries want their own data, which is, you know, very, very reasonable. So the first thing is, is sorting out the data, right? And then, and making it compatible and then using that to set your priorities. And there are, you know, a lot of different tools that, that countries can use or anybody can use, right, to, to then sort of manage the data. But I would say that the bigger question is, can you get the data right? Thank and you. can you do it quickly, right? Because we can spend 20 years getting the data right. And so it's, it's making those decisions of what do we have now? How much does it really need to be improved, um, you know, to get something that's good rather per than perfect and in the near term so that we're not spending 10 years planning and in the meantime, losing everything that you were planning to save anyhow. Thank you. Carolee? Well, just to make it maybe also practical, um, of course, this is not completely new. There is already work being done uh, more landscape oriented. Um, usually it is if you are a central government, you might have to reach out to municipalities or more regional governments, because the first question, of course, is what do you consider as your landscape? And uh, maybe maybe you can just start by thinking, by having a discussion, what are relevant landscapes for biodiversity within your country? What, and what is already there? What is already happening there where you can pick up on? And what are other uh, government agencies that are working in those landscapes? So I think you can make, have to make it very practical. Uh, and of course, landscapes can be defined by jurisdictional um, um, boundaries. boundaries, but also by biomes. And I think it would be really interesting. And also, if you look at this blended finance uh, 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 paper that we produced with the 23 examples, you see different biomes serving very well, or maybe islands, you know, so, so um, look at the practice and what are good examples. And maybe that can inspire you to think about what are interesting landscapes in your country and for your national biodiversity strategy and action plan. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Tracy. Uh, just quickly, so I agree with Lena, we need data. It's often missing, it's really important, but the thing to add, I would say is a convener at that landscape scale, the neutral and trusted convener, which might not be the usual suspects. Yeah, that's something that, of course, we've been doing lots of work on at Eco Agriculture Partners, and it's the focus of the work of a thousand landscapes is to empower, strengthen, help with capacities of those landscape partnerships. You know, have have the facilitators be strong. But one of the things we're seeing is there's all that action at the local level. There's a lot of action at the local level. There's a lot of action in places that aren't considered national priorities. But you know, they're really big priorities for local people uh, or for states or provinces, but then it may not rise to the level of the national priorities. And I guess the question I think that goes to the heart of what, what the questioner was, was, was asking is, how can, how can the national biodiversity planning process and finance process actually enable those initiatives, make them five times as powerful at protecting the biodiversity that's within their, their areas on the things they consider to be their priorities? Um, are there some other tools that, that, that we have in hand or that we need to be developing that can that can help them that can help them do that, and that in aggregate will contribute to the national biodiversity goals as well. Any any thoughts on that, Seth? Do you want to say something about that? I mean, that that's like as I mean, as Leah said, that's a big answer. I mean, the eco agriculture partners we've like written old papers about this question, <laughs> trying to yeah, you know, sure, trying to figure this out. And then there's actually a, a section in this this paper. It kind of lays out some of these roles of government uh, to support, you know, sort of landscape scale work. Uh, um, I Can you tell was, us one of the one or two of those? Well, things? I mean, there, there, there yeah. are ways that they could support the financial. I mean, what, one of the things we say is like, well, um, maybe the 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 fo there should be a focus on supporting, as Tracy says, these landscape scale institutions. That could be an explicit focus of government. Um, not as you know, if, if you want to support biodiversity, in you know, this could come from different you know ministries. But again, it's like, well, maybe the, the ministries could coordinate if your if your goal 
if your water and your biodiversity and your agriculture development, perhaps there's a way to kind of pull some of those resources, especially if you have the data and you have a framework for monitoring and everything. That's like the corollary to the data is like, what's your framework for, you know, reporting out to all these different places. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a scattered world of reporting too. You know, it's the challenge for the data. I'll, I'll give a sort of a, 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 a mention for some of uh, an initiative that CI and Rainforest Alliance and others are working on the land scale, um, which is about a landscape, a framework to monitor a variety of different outcomes of the landscape scale, which is really interesting for us also at EcoAg and within a thousand landscapes. Um, and uh, there could be sort of direct support, you know, building these institutions um, from the government rather than sort of the government just, oh, that's, that's a nice thing that happened that an NGO sort of you know, manage to figure out and scrape some money together. Like we want to support them. Not that they have to convene them, but that they, they recognize that this is a, a necessary element to do effective biodiversity conservation or, uh, you know, or to do water conservation or to do agricultural development because they're inherent. Everyone knows, I mean, it's not like rockets. I mean, everyone understands these things are inherently linked. So, you know, that that's, that's, that's one idea. Thank you, Seth. Sunita? Um, yeah, I guess I'm echoing uh, Seth now um, uh, after listening to what he said. So what I think the, the most primary or fundamental thing would be for the national government to actually um, recognize um, these approaches, which makes all these approaches legitimate um, and, and, and easier to gain support. Um, you know, if, if, if you want support, you've got to, you've got to be on the right side of the law and, you, um, and the law needs to recognize you. So it's as simple as that and as complicated as that. Um, so, so I would say, and that's why we are advocating so fiercely for landscape approaches to be included as the NDSABs are being developed. Um, because then it, it provides that framework, you know. And, and the other good thing is the GBF, so they've got the monitoring part no, now in the GBF. And they, they've allowed for non-state actors to also report on, 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 on houses, which is, which is a big shot in the arm. Um, so, so, you know, it really needs to match. You can't have the country being totally ignorant for all of these little, all of these various just dispersed work that's going on that's actually um, enabling, you know, helping them, adding well, uh, uh, strengthening the work that the country should be doing. But but it also comes to the point that but but um that facilitating this by recognizing they facilitate um, different forms of support that can go to these landscape um, initiatives um, that needn't necessarily wait for trickle down but can actually go together as a nested way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask a question of my own here to the group here. We are developing, we, you, all the folks in this in this virtual room are working on developing national biodiversity strategies and action plans. But in your country, you also have national climate plans for mitigation, national plans for adaptation. You have national plans for land restoration, for land degradation neutrality. You're starting, some of the countries are starting to have national plans for transformation to regenerative agriculture. All these things around land. How how can the NBSAPs and the National Biodiversity Finance Plans connect with those other? What are the what are the opportunities? What needs to happen for that connection to happen? Anybody got some ideas on that? I'm laughing because Seth and I went down a rabbit hole of visioning a new world a few <laughs> weeks ago, and it was about this. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your vision. What was it? Well, it was about the importance of this. So we, we have to. We cannot keep, we keep, and all of our silos keep saying we can't keep working in silos. And, and we just, we just can't, we've got to start bashing down those walls. So from, you know, it starts with how, so for, from a biofin perspective, we have a methodology for developing a biodiversity finance plan. And we've, we've just got new donor funding to integrate into our methodology, specifically, how do you address climate change and how do you address gender? Now that's two of the SDGs. Um, you know, we need, we need to like broaden a little bit more, but it's a step. Um, it's, a, it's, it's building it into the how that you develop NBSAPs and the how that you develop biodiversity finance plans, and then being really conscious about having the right people in the room. 
And it's hard because the right people might not want to come to the room because they don't think it's important. So especially from a biodiversity sector perspective, we tend to be not necessarily a, a political priority. So it's difficult to bring the people we need into the room to have these big integrated conversations, but we're seeing it more and more. And another thing just to mention before I see Lena's hand, and I know she's got some good stuff to say. Um, uh, we know also in INF apps, so integrate, National fund, integrated national funding frameworks, and it's the framework for funding SDGs at a country level. That is a space where everything can come together from at least from a, from a finance perspective. So, from for us, we're developing biodiversity finance plans. Those should be speaking to INFF development, and INFF development should be speaking to us. So that's that's one practical way of doing it. Fantastic. And Lena, I'm going to give you just a uh, 30 seconds to add to that, if you can. Okay. Great. Yep. So. I agree, right? It's about having all the right people talking to each other. And sometimes that's very simple, you know, unless you get resistance, which is the case sometimes. But in addition to that, we we often find that maps, you know, it's the simplest tool, it's easy to understand, and it can help different people from those different angles see exactly how their things connect. And that can really just help to say, okay, how do we work on this together then? Actually, that was one of my biggest surprises in participating in this project was to realize that there just weren't that many many maps in some of these plans. Um, and I, well, that was interesting. Um, well, thank you all uh, so very much, uh, Seth, Tracy, Carolyn, Lena, Sunita, uh, for your very thought-provoking ideas and your great inspiration. Um, and also to our event uh, co-organizers at uh, Biofin Conservation International and the Government of the Netherlands, um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank my colleagues at Eco Agriculture Partners who were working very much uh, in organizing this behind the scenes. Uh, Juan Ramos, one of the co-authors of the report, uh, Shannon Sunderland, Brianna Van Metra, and, and Isabella Klein. Thank you all so much for this. And a very big thanks to all of you who gave your valuable time to participate in this today. Very soon, we'll be circulating the recorded video a copy of the PowerPoint, an edited version of the chat to everyone who was registered, and hopefully we'll get that out. Please feel free to share that with all of your own networks. That would be wonderful. Um, and to get a lot of sort of, this was the, the intention of this report was to get people talking and thinking and creating, co-creating um, some of the solutions to, to what needs to happen. Um, this reporting shows how biodiversity champions can tap new sources of funding they haven't imagined that they could access. It, it also shows how champions of the other sustainable development goals can partner in developing the goals of the global biodiversity framework. Um, and as these new national biodiversity plans are developed next year, um, let's remember that we have allies from the climate action community, from regenerative agriculture, food and water security, land and forest restoration, inclusive green economies and thriving communities, all of these groups as Midori said at the very beginning, they have a stake for their economic well-being as well as their general welfare in protecting biodiversity. So let's invite them into the process and find some ways of doing that. I hope this will be the beginning of a much longer conversation. Thanks everyone and have a good rest of your day or evening. Thanks.